Welcome to Imagine Otherwise, the podcast about the people and projects bridging art, activism, and academia to build better worlds. Episodes offer in-depth interviews with creators who use culture for social justice and explore the nitty-gritty work of imagining otherwise. I'm your host, Kathy Hanneback. Welcome to Signal Boosting, a podcast miniseries collaboration between the Smithsonian Asian Pacific American Center, Ideas on Fire, and the Association for Asian American Studies. Each week during Asian Pacific American Heritage Month, we are highlighting an emerging scholar who's building new audiences for the field of Asian American Studies. The Signal Boosting miniseries aims to show how interdisciplinary scholars, activists, and artists are producing socially engaged work in multimedia forms, as well as inspire you to perhaps create your own. In this final episode of the miniseries, I interviewed Layla Sharif. Layla is an assistant professor in Asian American Studies and affiliated faculty with the Center for South Asian and Middle East Studies at the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign. She teaches courses on race and food, transnational settler colonialism, and Palestinian history. Layla is currently writing a book that traces the transnational olive from the moment it is plucked by Palestinian farmers to its global circulation in urban spaces through companies like Dr. Bronner's. In doing so, she elucidates the material, political, economic, and cultural landscapes that enable the simultaneity of violence and survival for indigenous peoples in Palestine and beyond. In our interview, Layla and I talk about the role of food in both transnational settler colonialism as well as resistance to it, how she uses the classroom to get students thinking about their own food histories, the complex dynamics of ethical consumerism, and decolonization as an embodied, everyday form of imagining otherwise. Thank you so much for being with us. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here. So you're working on a really fantastically interesting sounding book called All of Epistemologies. I'd love to hear a little bit about what that book covers. All of Epistemologies is a book about 21st century settler colonialism. And it specifically looks at uh, displacement for Native peoples, land struggles, food sites, and memory um, through a transnational feminist perspective. And basically, I want to look at the politics of everyday survival, specifically for Palestinians that are located in the West Bank, but also in California and Illinois, um, sort of in the Palestinian diaspora through the optic of the olive so I trace the olive from the moment that it is being harvested in the West Bank by Palestinian farmers to its circulation to places like California and Illinois. What's the Illinois connection? I'm just curious. So Chicago has one of the largest Palestinian populations in the United States. So it was really important for me to look uh, to find sort of the Palestinian enclaves in the U.S. And I was able to find it easily in San Francisco um, and in places like uh, Anaheim, California. Uh, But I was also really interested in sort of expanding beyond the West Coast and thinking about Palestinians who do live in the Midwest and specifically Chicago and how that sort of how they make a relationship to um, homeland and ties to uh, Palestine by their cooking practices and by cultivating um, and importing olive products from the West Bank. So in these kind of nodes of circulation that you're looking at, these locations, how is the olive circulating? Are we talking about olive products, olive oil, um, more perhaps abstracted products like soap or things like that? What are How exactly are these things circulating? So that's an interesting question because – the olive is, you know, people immediately make the connection that it's symbolically important, especially in a place like the Holy Land, right? There is a there are biblical references to the olive tree. Uh, my respondents would often refer to the tree as al shajar al muqaddasa, meaning the holy tree, um, and this is true for both Palestinian Muslims and Palestinian Christians. So the, the fruit itself has sort of a symbolic and spiritual um, aspect to it, but it, it's also a central staple in Palestinian cuisine and in the landscapes of the Middle East, of, of especially the, the Mediterranean region that is Palestine. 
Um, so, for example, the foods, Palestinian cuisine, uh, olive oil is always a central ingredient. It is something that people eat for breakfast with a side of crushed thyme called za'atar, which is seasoned with sesame and, and different kinds of um, herbs. And it's something that um, circulates. Those kinds of cuisine and cooking practices circulate to the United States and other parts of the world because First of all, most Palestinians live and die outside of historic Palestine. It's a largely refugee and diasporic population. And secondly, because olive oil has become sort of a site that Palestinians have always been drawn to, to connect back to homeland, whether it's through food, but also through medicine too. So things like heating up a little bit of olive oil, um, dipping a Q-tip in it and putting that inside a throbbing ear, or rubbing warm oil on a person's stomach, like a child's stomach. If they have a sour stomach, it tends to make some of that throbbing go away. So these kinds of practices are ones that Palestinian people in the diaspora carry with them um, naturally. But there are also other ways that it appears. And that's a lot of what my research is about, is how different companies are also taking advantage of this crop being so lucrative and so um, so saturated with these good fats, right? And, and this sort of um, trend in thinking holistically about food. So one example that I think about in that case is Dr. Bronner um, or Lush Cosmetics. So Lush Cosmetics is uh, produces different kinds of creams and soaps and shampoos, moisturizers. Everything is vegetarian or vegan. It has 600, 600 stores in 43 countries, including a North American division, so it's very widespread. And any of their fair trade olive oil ingredients um, in their products comes from a woman-led cooperative in the Galilee, which is in the northern region of um, 1948 occupied Palestine, uh, what is now Israel. And it sort of collects this olive oil from this co-op that is of Palestinian and Israeli women working together to develop this this sort of fine-grained olive oil that they can sort of sell back to places like this UK-based company. Uh, Dr. Bronner is another example. They are located in San Diego, California. That's where their headquarters are. But they're a Jewish company, or sorry, a Jewish family that was a Holocaust surviving family. And they wanted to do something to to sort of show that they are, you know, as people who identify as Jewish, that they are supporters of Palestinian independence. And one way that they do that is their magic soaps use about 90 percent of the oils um, that come in, in their magic soaps actually comes from Palestinian uh, producers through the Canaan Fair Trade Association. So it's sort of one that sort of in terms of businesses, but also ethical consumerism has created this trend in wanting to bring Palestinian products to the U.S. It seems like the olive is such a, a very kind of powerful, as you put it, optic to get at these really complex and much broader geopolitical, ethical, social stories. Absolutely. That's exactly right. So as I mentioned to you before, the olive is is not just symbolically important, but it's materially central for a Palestinian economy. And one of the ways that the settler colonial occupation has sort of happened, especially, uh, I think it's being especially well documented since the early 2000s, is the sort of systematic or decimation of Palestinian olive groves as part of a settler colonial project. So thinking about the olive as one that is not an ahistorical commodity that can be read to understand the pleasures and the desires of the consumer, but could also be used to tell stories about the people who are actively sort of resisting an occupation and have done so by really collecting their recipes and their memories around the olive tree um, as a one that sustains their history. Right. And so it has a sort of it's a very political um, and contextualized study of the olive from this particular context. So th this is something I'm trying to trace 
but also to understand, well, what are the checkpoints, right? When we think about Palestine, we think about checkpoints, we think about watchtowers, we think about an apartheid wall. What are the different checkpoints that the olive has to cross, right, in order to come to the U.S. to participate, to be a part of this um, commodity culture? And what's muted in that process are things that I'm really wanting to look to look at in this book project. Food seems like such a, a powerful tool to get at some of these questions. And your work, you know, intersects with issues of food justice, of kind of food as culture, food as nation building, food as community or diaspora building. And I'm curious how you came to this. How did your maybe own food practices or food histories shape the way that you enter this research or even in the classroom when you teach it? You know, it was not an immediate project. I didn't, you know, go on these many trips to Palestine and look at the olive tree and, and realize that's exactly what I was looking for. Initially, the project was about refugee remembrance and how refugees can connect to homeland through different practices. But a lot of times when I would interview, so, you know, when I was collecting my, you know, initial interview data set, I guess, I was talking to um, different people that were displaced but have memories of being located in Palestine and being, you know, born and raised there and having a life there. And I would ask them questions like, you know, tell me about 1948. Uh, and I was met with a lot of resistance. I mean, there were a lot of people that felt like it was really difficult to relive those memories. And I don't blame them. You know, I, I had one respondent once tell me a story um, he was in his late 60s, and he was telling me a story about being imprisoned um, in an Israeli prison and his mother coming to visit him. He was really young, and she had to come visit him, and they were able only to communicate through um, a, you know, an iron door. And, you know, you know, as he was relaying this story to me, he became very emotional and it kind of foreclosed the opportunity for me to really ask him more questions. I felt that it was unethical, to be honest with you. I thought that it was just, you know, really hard to ask people to relive that trauma. So my questions started to change to accommodate that, you know, and I think this is when, as a researcher, you're trained to do ethnography and you want to do it well, but you also want to respect the people that you're talking to and respect their histories and their stories. And so my question started to change to things like, you know, where did you learn this recipe? And a lot of the times I, it was much more of an invitation to speak rather than an uncomfortable conversation. So people would say things like, I recall learning this recipe from my grandmother who came from a village that no longer exists. And that kind of cued to me that people are still retaining an attachment to places through their memory. And it often happens through everyday practices like cooking and eating. And that became a bit more of the kind of project that I think I wanted to do, which is to really trace the intimate spaces that make Palestinian memory and learning that that is happening at the site of the hearth sort of became the way that I was able to continue doing this project. What is it like to teach about this? Do you have particular assignments or maybe approaches that you use to get your students maybe remembering some of these stories that they have themselves of food cultures and food memories? Absolutely. So I taught um, in my first semester here at University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign, I taught a course on food and race, and students were asked to look at um, sort of local eateries and to be able to understand sort of the histories in which they emerged in their campus town, right? And their sort of the places that they frequent. In their final projects, they were pushed to do a little bit more original work and research. And so um, one project, for example, looked at the ways that hummus has come to replace peanut butter as being the stellar um, protein, right, for, for people that are really health conscious. But positioning that within the debate of is Hamas Palestinian or is Hamas Israeli? And learning about sort of the different claims to these food sites 
Um, and so this particular person produced a paper about how what it means to think about hummus today um, as being an Israeli food, um, as an object of food appropriation, but also the different social movements that have come around hummus, such as boycott, divestment, sanctions, and others that have been about trying to promote Palestinian hummus, right, and to kind of uh, de denaturalize hummus as a specifically Israeli food when it is actually Palestinian. So students connected sort of a food site of their choice, and then they were, um, you know, basically they had to look at the political and cultural and social history of that um, product or commodity. And, um, and a lot of people were interested in doing it about Palestine because of the BDS campaign that has become so popularized um, especially with campus activism, but others were interested in talking about the history of things like chop suey and how that came about in a particular historical moment um, when Chinese exclusion from mainstream jobs created the site of the ethnic enclave, which then gave birth to the Chinatown and how this kind of informed the way that we experience Chinese food. So it's something you know, the, the critical lens from which we look at food and we contextualize it within these broader uh, social, cultural, historical and political contexts was something that they could think about in relation to any site at, of their choosing. And they had a lot of fun with that project and they produced um, a final presentation. And, you know, it was really great for students to learn from each other about their own community, where they go to school and where their food comes from, for example. So it proved to be a really great experience um, and a really rewarding one for me, too, as their professor. So I'm curious how you see your work um, in the classroom, in your research, in various other of your creative endeavors. How do you see your work combining activism, art, and, and academia? Well, I think that there are two major things that I'd like to do with this project. And I think one of the most important things is to look at food as political, right? So I'm looking at the olive as a cultural, environmental, and political site for looking at indigenous history, for looking at gendered memories, different kinds of colonial violence. Um, I'm also kind of moving away from the trends in food studies that tend towards discourses of excess, right, or, or deficiency, right? So it's all about who has access and where, and then who's deficient. And we can think about this in relation to a lot of the food desert literature, for example. But then there's also another trend that tends to look at indigenous food as something that is irrecoverable, right? That can't be, um, that's authentic and everything else is just a sham, right? Or is, you know, the only authentic way. But to look at how that gets complicated because of these different layers of colonialism that happen through space and time. So in a way, I want to rethink food as, as an important actor and as a medium that is involved in these sort of transnational circuits of militarization, but also local policies like in the Gaza Strip, for example, but also in terms of, you know, resistance efforts. And as I've mentioned, um, you know, how Palestinian women sort of retain the memory of particular cuisine and recipes as a way to not forget where, you know, that connection to a place that may not be located on a map, right? But it's one that still gets carried over, gets transmitted to um, generations as, a, as, a, as an important place, right, where, where people feel connected to. So this brings me to my favorite question that I get to ask people, which really gets at the heart of what this podcast is all about. And so obviously the name of this is Imagine Otherwise. And I feel very privileged to be able to talk to so many amazing creators and artists and scholars and activists who are doing just that in their work. They're creating a different world. They're collectively and supportively and fantastically creatively um, making some different world. So I'll ask you, what kind of world are you working towards when you get in front of a classroom, when you create your research, when you create the projects that you do in the world? What kind of world do you want? That's a really great question. And I can't wait to hear what others have said. But for me, when I think about a world that I'd like to imagine, 
I think that there is sort of an intellectual need to understand settler colonialism as it relates to food, environment, and culture, so that we can really start to think about what decolonization means, right? And we know that settler colonialism is not an event, but a process, right? And I want to sort of take this opportunity through this project to really think about this process and how it connects to people's daily lives. Um, and so taking decolonization seriously, I, I hope, I envision a world in which indigenous memories and traditions are not isolated from larger histories of displacement and colonial violence, but also a world in which indigenous homemaking and life making and spirit ways and food ways are respected and cultivated, especially in the face of a, a, dis a pending disappearance which is always the case in the context like Palestine. Well, thank you so much for being with us and sharing your vision of imagining otherwise. <laughs> thank you so much, Kathy. It was a pleasure. Thanks for joining us for this episode of Signal Boosting. You can view the show notes for this episode created by Priyanka Kara on the Ideas on Fire website at ideasonfire.net, as well as find links to the people, projects, and resources we discussed. The Signal Boosting miniseries is a collaboration between the Association for Asian American Studies, the primary research and teaching hub for Asian American Studies as a dynamic interdisciplinary field, Ideas on Fire, an academic editing and consulting agency that works with progressive interdisciplinary academics, and the Smithsonian Asian Pacific American Center, a migratory museum that brings Asian Pacific American history, art, and culture to you through innovative museum experiences online and throughout the United States.